<laughs> okay, let's see if we can see what's here. Oh. Okay, so um, thanks for the intro. So I'm going to just spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about where I think we are in AI and maybe what still needs to be done and uh, you know how exciting the future might look. So first of all, you know, what, is, what is machine learning? What are the kinds of things it's good for? So many of you perhaps are familiar with this, but I think it needs sort of restating, from my opinion at least, what really machine learning is about, right? So a lot of people see machine learning as, say, generic large-scale data analysis, but I personally don't have that viewpoint. I think that's a kind of uh, a misrepresentation of what machine learning is. For me, machine learning is about replicating human abilities, for example, in image processing, uh, speech, etc. So this is a kind of classical problem you might face, you know, given an image like this of a face, is this face male or female, right? So maybe that's something that we are quite good at as humans, but it's maybe hard to define a compact set of rules which would explain this, right? It's not easy to, to write that down. So the idea in machine learning is that a human will label these images for us, into male or female, and then we try to replicate that human labeling by the machine, right? So that's a kind of, uh, if you like, a statistical approach, which has a large set of training data, and then tries to replicate the human's labeling, right? So in that sense, it's really reproducing a human ability. So one of the sort of dominant approaches right now to this is this deep learning. And this actually started a long time ago, and this uh, general approach is called connectionism. So already in the 1930s and 40s, people were interested in this idea. And actually, when the first computers came into being, these were some of the first things in AI that actually were implemented on the original computers back in the 1950s and uh, even earlier, actually. So the first uh, attempt to make this was actually called the Perceptron in 1960, which could only solve very simple visual tasks, like recognizing certain kinds of simple shapes but it actually wasn't particularly successful and there was a lot of uh, drop in interest and a lot of uh, cutting in the funding, particularly in the 1970s. And this was actually the, the start of the so-called AI winter, the first AI winter. And uh, I think really what was interesting for us is that this paradigm of trying to solve these AI challenges, replicating human abilities, based upon machines which operate a little bit like humans do, actually never really died. It was always kind of like being bubbling under the surface. And then when the 80s came along with the PCs, this actually made it much uh, easier for people to get access to these kinds of compute power that you need to try these kind of technologies. So the idea is you have some kind of you know, inputs and they get propagated through some network and these weights of this network are all adjustable in some way to try to uh, solve the task that you have at hand. So for example, is it a male face or is it a female face? So we've kind of, uh, you know, sort of developed on this kind of model over the years, and we've improved it significantly. But we've also taken advantage of the huge improvements in compute and data power that we have right now. So you know, that's made a huge difference, really. So right now we can do all kinds of crazy things. We can have videos like this, and in real time we can we can track the limbs of the the person. We see where they are in real time. That's something that we couldn't do even a couple of years ago, at least not in real time. It's really incredible. Uh, but there are other things that we can't do which are quite as impressive, right? So for example, if I were to give you this paragraph of text here at the top, and I ask you some questions like, why did grandpa answer the door? Then as humans, we are pretty good at this, right? We could read through this text as long as we're alert enough and we'll hopefully get the right answer, one of those A, B, C, or D questions. But if you ask a machine to do this, it's not particularly good at it. It's actually pretty bad at answering these questions. It's only around maybe 50% accurate, right? So why is that? Why is, this, why is the machine so poor at this kind of challenge? Well, the reason is when the machine reads this, you know, it has no deep understanding of what this, comp what this uh, paragraph is about. What do these words mean? It doesn't really know. They're just symbols, right? They're not really relatable in some way to each other. That's a very shallow, superficial understanding of this uh, sentence or what these paragraphs are trying to say. So typically what people do is they do something like they take, why did grandpa answer the door, and they try to scan it, raster it across this paragraph, 
desperately hoping to find some kind of statistical similarity between the question and some part of the paragraph and then dig into that bit that looks most similar or desperately try to find one of those four answers which might be the most similar within that part. So essentially, it's quite remarkable. Actually, the computer gets anywhere at all. You know, sort of without knowing anything about it, any understanding of grandpa's doors, et cetera, no, no clue, it somehow gets about 50% accurate. Right, so random is 25% because of four questions here. So it's better than random, but it's not particularly good. So in some sense, you know, the challenge here for, for AI is not really about you know, doing, say, uh, processing like in videos. That's cool, right? That's really nice and it's very exciting and it's very uh, good. But the grand challenge of AI is getting access or the machine getting access to the kinds of information that we humans have. We know what doors are, we know what grandpas are, we know all this kind of stuff, we know the way the physical world works, right? This is something the machine doesn't have access to at all. And if we want machines to actually really interface with us in much more natural ways, they need access to that kind of information in some way, either internally within the machine or somehow it needs to be queryable by some external database. Without that, we are never really gonna get much further along this, uh, this AI path. So another example of this is translation. So this paragraph on the left, in English I use Google Translate to translate that into Chinese, with pinyins written here, then uh, retranslate that back from pinyin back into English. So for some languages like English to French, it's kind of okay, you know, the original English paragraph and its retranslation look quite similar, the, the meaning is preserved. But here, actually, if you were to read this, you'd recognize that actually quite a lot is lost, right? And again, you know, why, why is that? Well, the machine is not looking at this paragraph of text. Oftentimes, people feel bananas from the stand down. It has no clue. It's not sort of thinking about this, oh, there's a, you know, there's a monkey, it's peeling a banana, it's doing all this kind of stuff, what's going on? No clue. It's just a totally superficial, almost word by word translation, which is just rearranged into the grammatically most likely structure. So it's completely devoid of any understanding at all. So again, it's quite remarkable actually that machines do so well in translation at all without actually having any deeper sense of what's going on. So that's okay uh, in some sense. You know, if you're needing a superficial translation, that's okay. But as we go further in AI, that's not enough. That's not the end goal of AI. We want machines which can deeply comprehend and deeply understand what's going on, okay? So this is an interesting example in, in China. Microsoft had this chatbot which uh, you know, had some interesting properties. So for example, this journalist here uploads a picture of his swollen ankle and the uh, chatbot says something like, uh, you know, uh, kiss it better or something like that, right? So, um, so this is quite remarkable, you know? So the Chinese are very uh, sort of happy to interact with these kinds of things. The average number of interactions is around 25. So people in China are really interacting with this chatbot as if it was some kind of real person. It was very uh, successful. So. Microsoft then was buoyed by this, enthusiastic, and they released this into, into the West. And this was their thinking of you, um, a bit of a disaster, where they have a similar chatbot, but they learned from interacting with humans, right? So the, through Twitter, the way that, we, that we people would respond to the machine, the machine would learn from those responses. And pretty quickly, you know, within uh, hours, of course, we cynics in the West, it's like, well, you know, let's break it, right? Let's, uh, let's take this machine and see how quickly we can break it. So this is, in some sense, not necessarily criticism of Microsoft's chatbot and natural language processing abilities, um, but it's more a criticism of the way that we in the West think about these technologies. You know, we're very skeptical about them, we're very critical, very cynical about them, whereas in Asia, people tend to be much more receptive to these kinds of technologies. So that's also, something that's very important to bear in mind when you're thinking about the eventual application and, and usage of these technologies in society. So that's a critical thing to understand and recognize why in, in Asia, in my opinion, things are likely to race ahead at a much faster pace than here in the West. Another interesting thing that which you've seen uh, a lot of excitement about in, uh, recently is things like playing games, visual games, like uh, Atari games, right? So Space Invaders, you, the machine just sees a sequence of the previous four video frames. Can you predict the next move to make which uh, the machine should take to, to win the game or to play the game well? So this would be some kind of deep neural network. The images get represented here in the input layer. The weights of the network are adjusted until it can learn some kind of decent sequence of actions to, to play the game well. Right, so that's, that's kind of cool. And actually, in some sense, you know, it's kind of interesting, um, but is it really that interesting? So in my opinion, it's not that interesting because 
There's a whole suite of games here, which um, this is kind of Atari games, and it's kind of interesting that human level performance is here, and some of the machine can play much, much better than the human can. It's miles better than the human. But actually, there are other areas where the machine is much worse than the human. So games, for example, like uh, Montezuma's Revenge, the machine is much, much worse than the human. Why is that? Because Montezuma's Revenge, you have to go around and pick up objects, like keys, to go down corridors, eventually do something along long sequence of action, and then eventually put this key in some door or some box and unlock it, right? And the probability that you would actually take that long sequence of very specific actions just by randomly exploring actions to take is basically zero. It never, never works, right? So games like uh, Space Invaders are easy. You can just take random actions, and uh, yeah, you, within a short amount of time, you'll hit something, right? You'll get, a, you'll get a success. You get feedback relatively quickly. But in these kinds of other games, it's, it's delayed. It's massively delayed, and you have no chance of randomly exploring just to find any decent result, right? So humans don't play games like that. We know what keys are. We know they're useful things. We pick them up. We know what doors are. We know the relationship between these things. That's why we as humans can solve this. There's another example as to why we cannot progress in AI unless and until we actually include those kinds of piece of information into the machine or give, have it access to those, those uh, pieces of information. Okay, so just uh, finally, I think you know another interesting area which has come up more prominently in the last few years is things like explainability and adversarial machine learning. So an interesting example here is you have this stop sign. So we're very good at making speech, uh, sorry, uh, image recognition systems which can recognize uh, images like the stop sign. But these nefarious researchers here have put these little stickers, love and hate, there and actually completely fools the the machine has gone from a very high accuracy of recognizing the stop sign to a relatively low accuracy. So this is this is because we you know we didn't think about this right. Again you know the West we we're a cynical bunch right. We try to break the machine. So in some ways it's kind of good, but we do need to to bring these considerations into the way we train the system. So that's important. Another example is in things like uh, ethical issues like insurance since uh, the early uh, well, 2011 and onwards. It's been illegal to use gender to determine car insurance premiums, but actually uh, there were other kinds of issues to that. You know, so if I know that not your gender, but I know that say you have a certain salary and you drive a pink VW, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I can infer perhaps your gender implicitly, right? So the the legal status of this is not completely clear at the moment, but it's not long, in my opinion, before we'll see court cases where people are going to complain that actually they were, in some sense. Um, discriminated against by some algorithm, even though it was implicit, the discrimination, and not explicit. And that's something that I think we'll, we'll need to also take into consideration very soon. Okay, so uh, yeah, this has become you know much uh, kind of important thing in the last few years, and suddenly there's a big move in right now to make fairness and transparency much more uh, part of our thing. So they, I think I just want to summarize by saying that I think the, in the last two slides is that there's a huge potential here in Europe, but I think we need more leadership, we need more focus on the genuine core challenges of AI, and that is about getting the information that humans have into the machine. I think we need to be much smarter about the way that we do this, we need to much better regulations, we need a much better understanding of the constraints of regulations on progress, that's very important. But I think generally Europe and here, particularly in places like London, you know, we have a great opportunity for changing this debate. Also, I think the way that research funding is happening needs to change a little bit. We need to go away from very small-scale research funding at the university level, to much grander challenges. But I think overall, the future is very bright. But I think until we solve those integration of AI information that humans have access to into the machine, we're not going to make sufficient progress. So I'll stop there. Thanks. David. Thank you for setting the scene so well. Um, our next speaker is Ryan from Kindy. Um, Ryan uh, has a background in applied maths and then was a quant on Wall Street for eight years. He started Kindy out of business school in 2014. I'm really looking forward to hearing his presentation. Welcome. Okay, I can use this. All right, good morning. Uh, I'm a little jet lagged. Um, been up since about 1 a.m. this morning. Flew in from Silicon Valley <laughs> about two days ago. 
So my name is Ryan Welsh. I'm the founder and CEO of Kindy. Uh, we're a venture-backed AI company in Silicon Valley. And I believe that for AI to thrive, it must be explainable. That's super awkward, right? You want me to explain to you why it needs to be explainable? <laughs> Isn't that weird? I mean, if I was a neural network, I just would have walked off stage. <laughs> Which means the number one reason is usability. Every time we interact with customers, the number one thing that they want is some level of explanation. What's unique about humans is our desire and our ability to ask why. And the reason we give reasons is so we can judge people's belief systems and actions. And the same thing with a computer. So if it's going to make a recommendation about taking some action, I believe that it needs to provide an explanation to a user so that they can then take that action. The next reason is accountability, and David was just, just touching on this, is whether it's implicit or explicit, I believe we're going to start to see these, these court cases where people will be held accountable for their actions, specifically when we start using AI in more um, impactful use cases for human beings, which arrives at this little framework that I've come up with. Um, I've seen this with, with our customers and how to think about explainability and whether or not it's actually ne needed and what level of explainability is needed because there's varying levels of explainability. And how people and CIOs from organizations are kind of thinking about this is what is the impact of the decision to a human being and what is the time to human confirmation? And just some examples here. So let's take classifying cat pictures. So I have the best cat in the world and I take so many pictures of that cat. And if a deep learning system were to classify a picture into the wrong folder, you know, who cares, right? And for me to de determine whether or not that system actually classified it into the wrong folder, it's pretty quick. You just look at the picture, right? Now, you may say the impact of a decision or the impact uh, for screening x-rays is significantly higher, so you need explainability. Well, maybe, maybe not. Because what's interesting about x-rays is if a system identifies a broken bone, the doctor can hold it up to the light very quickly and see, confirm the decisions, the, the system's decision. So in some instances where it may be regulatory or something like that, you may need explainability, but in some instances you, you may not. Now where we work at Kindy and where we use, all of our use cases are, are out here in synthesizing military intelligence reports, working with pharma customers, working with financial services, all over unstructured text data. So very high impact of a decision. And because it's text data, it takes an incredibly long time to read and understand and ultimately confirm the system's decision, which leads to a really interesting finding that, that, that we found. And this is by and large. There's always tail cases for all this stuff. Um, but explainability, we found, is most necessary on decisions um, that have a high impact to third parties. Um, and a long time to confirmation, it actually comes from text data. And when you think about it, picture is worth a thousand words. It takes the average person four minutes to read a thousand words. It takes the top 1% of readers to, to read a thousand words. So if I were to confirm a system's decision, I would actually have to wait four minutes as opposed to holding up to the light and taking maybe four seconds. So it's a really interesting framework. And of course, you know, you, there are exceptions. You may have autonomous vehicles and other th things out here that are image analysis or, or video analysis. But we've seen, by and large, this kind of be the, the way that CIOs think about it throughout the enterprise. And what's, what's interesting about explainability, and we, we uh, positioned as explainable AI when we launched the company in, in June 2014, when not many people were thinking about it. But explainable AI has just been bombarded with a bunch of different definitions from, from vendors. 
Um, you have some vendors out on the market talking about training data quality management as explainable AI. So they will ensure that the training data that you use for a system is not biased, thus we have an explainable AI system. You'll see systems where you'll use a deep learning network to analyze another deep learning network and find the nodes of influence in and out of layers, and ideally you can map that back to some input data. We're seeing that positioned as explainable AI. We're seeing transparency being positioned as explainable AI, where I know what developer used what model with what parameters and what training data and put it into production on what data and at what time. That's explainable. We're seeing visualizations, things like provenance, which is ultimately footnotes to, to a, to a um, uh, natural language generation system. And then you have your classic proof and causal methods. And then we're seeing some natural language explanations, all of this being bundled into explainable AI. And it's actually been, been quite confusing out on, on the market. Um, and you need varying levels of these things for the different two by two that I just showed. So at Kindy, as I was, I was sharing, we help enterprises get value out of their unstructured text data. So we work with government agencies, we work with pharma customers, and we work with financial services. And it's all about helping them get value out of their unstructured text data. And for us, explainability came down to fusing together really three types, actually the two main, I call them the two main paradigms of, of AI. It's machine learning with the knowledge representation and reasoning or the symbolic approaches. And the benefits that we got out of this was the explainability. Um, but then we also got data efficiency and better generalization. And I'll get into how exactly we, we, we did this. And this is the technical bits for, the, for some of the technical people in the room. So effectively, what we're able to do with, uh, this is a proprietary sys uh, algorithm that, that we have, is we identify objects in raw data and we're actually able to machine learn the relationships between those objects so that our learned network actually takes advantage of the full expressive power of logic. So we're essentially machine learning what we call a proto-ontology from, from data. We, we then use that data model in a graph engine. And this graph engine fuses together um, your symbolic approaches with your vector-based uh, continuous math approaches. Um, and we're able to get some scalability benefits from this engine, which if people have worked with graphs, um, scaling graphs is, can be quite, quite challenging. So when we think about explainability at, at Kindy, and here's just a, a simple query um, of a, a document that we uploaded from, from UC Berkeley Research Project, um, ideally we get to a place where the system can provide its reasoning in natural language to the average user. But today, what our customers wanted to see was insights into the graph that we use to bring back certain queries. So here's a very simple, this is just one, one word, so the graph wasn't, wasn't too large. But you saw that the, the top result that was brought back talked about a generator, didn't talk about electricity. So here you're able to see the nodes of influence that brought back that query, and those nodes in our network are terms. So you can see that the generator is an electrical generator as opposed to a random number generator or a password generator, which would not have been what you wanted to, to come back. So you're able to see what are the terms or what is the space that the system is looking at when it's ultimately reasoning over this, this graph structure. And then you're also able to dig down into the sentence and this was the, the provenance that I talked about. And what we found with our customers is not only do they want some level of insight into your learned network, but they also want to be able to drill down into the underlying data to ensure that it was of, of quality. So um, this document, you're able to see that it was a UC Berkeley report. It wasn't generated on the internet by some right-wing or left-wing uh, American political site. Um, but you're able to have some confidence that this underlying data is quality uh, to you. So these are a few ways that we are working explainability into the system. Um, and we found that users really enjoy being able to um, work with this system when they can look into what it's doing and why it's ultimately doing it. So just to, just to summarize real, real quick, 
I think explainability is absolutely critical for AI to thrive. If we want to see the benefits of AI throughout society, I think explainability is, is, is critical. And I think the path to explainability is actually the combination of symbolic approaches and machine learning approaches. Um, and that's what we're doing here at Kindy. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. So um, we're, I'm looking forward to getting into this um, question of symbolic versus connectionist when we get into the panel session afterwards. But next up, our speaker, Juran Wang. He got his PhD in computer science from UCL in 2009, and then he's been working with Baidu and Toshiba. Um, he set up Trio.ai with two um, co-founders in 2016. Um, and I think it's fair to say that this is, this is a really exciting example of deep learning in the wild. So looking forward to hearing from you, Duran. <coughs> Thanks for the introduction. My name is Duran Wang from Trio.ai. Trio is a startup in China, and we provide the conversational AI solutions for different industries. So today my talk is uh, more from the uh, application point of view, but uh, I'll give you an overview of how conversational uh, AI works and uh, how it can be applied to you know, different scenarios. Okay, so conversational AI, AI, I mean, in general means we are building uh, virtual agents that can talk with you uh, using natural language. And when we talk about that, we are actually talking about a stack of different technologies such as speech recognition, uh, speech synthesis, natural language processing, and a lot of machine learning problems behind them. And it can be used in, uh, like for you know, consumer electronic smart devices or you know, for industry or for enterprise use like call center automation, which I'll talk about in details later, and you know, other industries like computer games, for example. So, <coughs> I mean, due to the, uh, sorry, due to the uh, latest breakthroughs in speech, speech technologies and natural language processing, the uh, conversational agents are more and more usable nowadays. So they are actually assisting our daily lives here and there. And, but, I mean, natural language processing is still an unsolved problem in general. There's no universal solutions for natural language processing and the, ha the models has have to be uh, built you know, uh, in a uh, domain specific or problem specific way. So that's why there's no uh, a universal agent like in the science and <laughs> fiction movies that can do everything for you. So the chatbots have to be built, I mean, skill by skill and uh, for vertical domains and so on. So let's, let's, let's start from a vertical domain like for, for enterprise solutions, for example, call center automation, which is a very typical uh, application, application scenarios for conversational AI. The idea is we, we want to build a virtual agent that can answer telephone calls from your customers to replace the <coughs> human representatives. And then the same technology can also be reshaped to, you know, to use to analyze the uh, telephone calls by, by human operators and users to like for quality assurance or for you know business logic optimization and so on. Okay, so to what extent that te technology helps? I'll give you one example. This is a this is a provincial call center of China Mobile who use our uh, chatbots to answer their telephone calls. So now the the service covers. Uh, over 70, uh, sorry, 17 cities in that province, and the chatbot is answering uh, 10 million calls every month. And I mean, there's a figure that uh, now 30% of the telephone calls are answered by our chatbot, and there's another 40% of the telephone calls are actually dealt with, uh, deal with by the traditional touchpad, <coughs> touchpad based uh, IVR, means there are only 30% of the calls are answered by human nowadays. And uh, the estimated task completion rate is, uh, uh, is over 90%, and the uh, you know, overall user sat satisfaction rate is over 90% as well. So that, I mean, it's, it's exciting, right? You, you, you see the figures shows that the, the, the chatbot <coughs> really you know, 
reduce the, the labor cost in your call centers, but does it mean every call center should have a chatbot? Or, you know, do you need to invest to that technology to, you know, reduce your labor cost in call centers? The answer is, it somehow depends. I mean, there, there are three conditions that you, 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 you gain from investing into this technology. Firstly, you need to have a large call center. You need to have a lot of people, I mean, labor costs so that you're motivated to invest on the technology. And the second condition is you should have a, you know, a comprehensive infrastructure that supports the chatbot to complete the task. Otherwise, your chatbot can't do the task. It has to transfer the call to human, right? And thirdly, you, you need to have a well-structured uh, knowledge base or domain knowledge that enables the chat chatbots to understand your uh, users' questions and so on. So this, these two conditions can be built. I mean, they are, it's engineering work anyway, but you need to have a strong motivation to actually invest on these technologies to, to do so. And this is an uh, analysis based on, based on Chinese industries, actually. You can see telecom carriers is actually the best industry to apply this kind of chatbot because they have everything. They have large call centers with tens of millions of representatives, and they have ex excellent infrastructures and knowledge and so on. And for example, garment is it's interesting, right? They have nothing, but they have a strong motivation to build everything, to upgrade everything from the ground. But other industries, it's kind of variable and moderate. For example, banks and financial companies, they have a relatively smaller call centers with like thousands of representatives, but their infrastructure is, is moderate. It's not, uh, you know, 100% ready for chatbots to, to do every task and so on. And this is a <coughs> report cited f from iResearch. It's showing that the AI chatbot itself has a reasonable market size, but more importantly, it's leveraging uh, the downstream and upstream industry a lot, so you have a potentially very big market there enabled by AI chatbots. Okay, let's look into the consumer electronic industry as well. So these two figures are cited for <coughs> from strategy analytics this year, I think last year or this year, okay. So it's showing there's a fast growth of smart speaker markets in China. Nowadays, like about half of the smart speakers are produced and sold in China. And as David just mentioned, I mean, I mean, usually those smart speakers are dominated by giant companies such as Baidu, Xiaomi, and so on, but there, there are a lot of potential opportunities for startups in China as well. As David said, mentioned this morning, there's a subculture in, in China that people love to talk to this kind of virtual agent. And the social chatbots is considered as a must-have functionality for those smart devices, smart speakers that can talk with you. Uh, for example, we collaborated with, with Baidu, and Baidu actually built, integrate our social chatbots into their platform as a built-in functionality that you say anything that is irrelevant to the task-specific task uh, domains, so it's, it will be dealt by, by our ch social chatbot. And we also extend that service to you know, the ACG industry, uh, anime, comics, and games industry, and we, we build like uh, uh, virtual characters for computer games that can you know, talk with you in a very expressive way and very human-like way, we can also, to some extent, customize the language style to reflect the predefined personality of such uh, virtual characters. And when we talk about consumer electronics, we can't skip uh, smartphones, which is uh, still the largest uh, entrance of the internet flow. But virtual assistant, like Siri and so on, has been proven to be not a very popular product form. So we actually invent another type of interaction on mo mobile devices. This feature called Smart Touch is <coughs> invented and uh, you know, promoted by us. The idea is we process text a lot on our mobile phone every day. For example, you receive text message from your messenger and SMS and you browse web pages and so on. Previously, when you 
find some information within the text that interests you. It's not very convenient to extract that out and to do first further search. But now with this smart, <coughs> smart touch feature, every piece of text message on your mobile screen can just long touch it to trigger our natural language understanding feature. And we will automatically recognize the intent and extract the semantic, informa semantic information from that text. And we pop up this kind of information card. You click on it, you, you, will, be <coughs> you will directly invoke a third party service or, or information. It's like a one click operation to lead you to a third party uh, information or service that results, uh, you know, create the current app. It's a very quick uh, uh, video demo to show how this works. This service has been integrated into uh, 14 different brands of uh, Android mobile phones in China, and we got a, lo a lot of traffic every day. Currently, we support over 30 domains and uh, over 100 different services at back end. And we, we deployed it last year, and now we, we receive a, a huge traffic every day. We about like uh, 80 million user visits per day with uh, 20, about 20 million active daily active users. And this is the you know user activity analysis where it covers different domains and different scenarios. And behind this, we are uh, <coughs> doing a, a traffic monetization business model. So, for for certain domains, we try to you know uh, distribute advertisement and integrate service integration and so on to share. I mean, convert the traffic into revenue and share that, re that revenue with uh, mobile manufacturers. Okay, in the end, there are cross-industry players as well. I mean, for example, Foxconn, the big factory who assemble mobile phones and uh, for Apple, for other, you know, mobile companies and so on, they are actually launching a, a, a robot that can, you know, it's kind of in between of a robot and a smart speaker with screens, with touch sensors, stress sensors, cameras. It's like a multimodal interaction a platform that is built by, by us. They invested, <coughs> sorry, they invested us and uh, we like co-build co this product. And s imagine that the output capacity of Foxconn Plus is, uh, you know, advanced uh, hardware and software design. We can output this kind of uh, robots either as a consumer electronic or all as a, you know, vertical domain robot for other businesses. For example, this now placed in uh, the Imperial Palace in Beijing. It's used like a guide for a natural treasure painting, uh, the river, uh, sorry, along the river during Qingming Festival. So it's like a, a robot in the museum that gives you information about uh, certain antique uh, paintings and so on. Okay, I'll skip. Okay, to, con <coughs> to conclude that constitutional AI is uh, actually enabling uh, many emerging markets and it's, uh, I mean, for in the uh, consumer electronics and also it's a fast growing market in enterprise solutions and so on. Especially, I mean, in China, there's many innova <coughs> innovative and uh, unique features that the constitutional AI is enabling. So, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Juran. Do stay here and take All a seat, right. please. Um, and if Ryan and David would join us on stage, we're going to have a short panel session now. Thank you. So um, today we have, we're trying to move the conversation from the cutting edge research that we talked about yesterday to uh, more what does that cutting edge research enable in terms of applications. Um, we've got a short panel right now, but there's a meet the speaker session af immediately afterwards. So if you want to carry on the conversation, then um, I'm just looking to see if I can see my colleague Tom. Over there, Tom over there will have a sign and please please join him to, um, to continue talking. Let's, let's start with um, an easy question. 
and then we'll maybe delve into some of the more uh, difficult aspects. So, um, given that we're talking about applications today, um, can you give one example of something, um, some research in the last five years that in it has enabled something really exciting, impactful, or surprising in terms of applications today? Um, and I'm going to go to Ryan first. Uh, sorry, so it was re research? That's enabled yeah, an exciting for, application. For me, yeah. I've just been super uh, uh, excited about uh, word, word vectors and vector embeddings. Uh, for, for me, we use them a, we use them a lot. So it's it's just been very can you, very. Can you give a quick quick little overview of, of what uh, a word embedding sure. is? <laughs> yeah, of, of, of taking stuff from a high dimensional space to a lower dimensional <laughs> space. Sure, sure, sure. And then and then you get you get these um, uh, words that that all have some semantics distance between them, and you can see some similarities between those those words. We then use those outputs of of um, vector embeddings to. Uh, build these ontological structures, so we do apply some hierarchy to them. Um, but for, for me, word vectors have, have been super interesting and been very helpful for us putting stuff into, into production and kind of getting to the ca comprehension aspects of, of what Dave was talking about. David? Um, well, I think there are certain tools. I think when you think about uh, machine learning, you know, that used to be really the kind of academic arena, right? You needed a PhD or a degree in mathematics to even start playing around with this stuff. And I think one of the really interesting things that happened is a lot of the tools that have been made available which really democratize access to these kinds of technologies. So I think that you know, the explosion that we see now you know, with events like this is not because of you know, the necessarily the research breakthroughs which happen in academia, but because of the ability for many, many people, including startups, you know, to get access to these technologies without that, you know, sort of like, you know, deep, deep, deep training that you may have previously needed. So, obviously, Do you, do you yeah. mean here the sort of the frameworks that are available or? Yeah, so, I mean, for example, you know, automatic differentiation would be one of them, right? But there are also open source frameworks for, uh, you know, sort of applying machine learning as well. And I think that's really, you know, really important as a, as a story in the sense that these things are not necessarily new. I think also in the same sense that, you know, machine learning and some of the technology we're using are not necessarily that uh, new in some ways, but the sort of the, the tools that you have that access those technologies are very important. And I think, you know, the, how polished they are really is, is, very, is very important. So deep learning um, technologies like automatic differentiation have been around since the 1970s actually, but, you know, only recently have people started to use them. And I think that's been key. We're going to come back to that point. Thank yeah. you. Juram, would you like to? Yeah, I'm this? thinking about the, you know, following the, the word vector now, it's like, a you know, the latest breakthrough in NLP, the pre-training models like BERT, like GPT-2, right. that you can, yeah. you know, pre-train something, you know, in general with very big data and fine-tune it uh, in a task-specific way, and that helps NLP a lot. And, yeah. So that speaks again to David's point, there's been a certain mm. democratization, one yeah. might say. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, so let's, let's move on. Um, I wonder if you could comment on an impression I have. So I work for Digital Catapult. We're interested in um, encouraging the adoption of advanced machine learning methods. But what we see in the real world often is that um, what works is symbolic methods or more established machine learning techniques. Um, do you have any comments on that? I think one of the hardest things of, of uh, putting something into production is just the infrastructure that, that uh, an enterprise needs. So we're starting to see the infrastructure uh, startups um, get, get traction first, and I think that'll help putting models in, uh, put models in, into production. And by infrastructure, sorry to interrupt you, do you mean the, the uh, kind of data Yeah, training data, model management, I mean, all of that stuff that, that, that you need to, to really put something in, in production. I mean, I mean, Facebook, Google, all the big companies, they built that themselves. So you're seeing companies like uh, my friend's company, Algorithmia, um, provide that infrastructure. Um, but, but you're right, a lot of the stuff that's, that's in use today is, you know, you go back to whether it's semantic, techniques, I mean, behind Siri and Alexa, there's these giant knowledge bases and, and, and things. So yeah, you use simpler machine learning techniques, knowledge bases, um, knowledge representation and reasoning, but I think infrastructure is what's holding back kind of the more sophisticated uh, deep learning techniques to be put in production at the enterprise. Anything else? Culture? 
maybe there are some things that deep learning can't do well? Yeah, explainability. It's a, it's another big <laughs> one. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, that's 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 the biggest one. I mean, I think it was there's survey by by IBM showed that 88 percent of executives don't want to put deep learning in production if they can't explain its 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 reasoning. So it's it's, it's really holding holding it back. And yet, Zuran Trio is largely using deep learning. Yeah, we we, we use deep, deep learning a lot, but it's I mean. As I mentioned, in the real world, it's always a combination of symbolic and uh, deep learning. I'll give you a very specific example for call center automation, the quality assurance. It's like uh, closely related to the business logic that you can't learn actually directly from the data. You have to use deep learning models to build representations and build uh, that's a very fundamental part and use the symbolic logics to com combine them to, to actually output the product. Correct. David, would you like to comment? Yeah, so I think a couple of things to say is, I mean, so I think there's um, certainly infrastructure is a, is a challenge. So if you think about, say, banking, right? So people basically treat email as like, uh, as like electronic paper, right? You know, yeah. basically a lot of industries are, either they, they feel founded on exchanging bits of paper, right? In sort of grand scale between themselves. And the email is just an electronic version of that. So I think there are a lot of legacy issues there, particularly with large scale you know, enterprises like banking, insurance, et cetera. But it becomes more difficult to apply these things, not necessarily because of the, the technology per se, but just getting the infrastructure really there. It's not, it's not, it's not easy to do that. So that's one of the things that I've, I've seen a lot. I think another one of the, the challenges is just really you know, getting people to sort of, I think there's this perception in, in business that if you buy these AI systems, they're like, uh, they're gonna come in and they're gonna solve everything for you, right? They're kind of like, well, I'll just spend, you know, X squillion quid on this uh, Watson thing or whatever it is, and you know, why isn't it doing what I want? And there's a little bit of a sense of, you know, over um, expectation for what these technologies can do, but a sense of disappointment that they're not this sort of yeah. all singing or dancing thing. And I think we need to shift the, the focus away a little bit from that to actually that these tools are things that you can um, interface with and humans can actually help continually train these systems within organizations. So that's something I think that you know, we're starting to see much more of, but I think that's a, a perceptual shift that really is required for people to realize that these technologies are not necessarily, oh, I buy this all thing and all that thing and it's gonna do everything for me, but no, it's a tool which will enable my company to perform more efficiently and get the most out of my, my workforce by interacting naturally with the system. Perfect, thank you. So let, let me flip the question a little bit then. Um, so deep learning may not always be, um, may, may be in the um, adoption phase um, and obviously shows great promise, but there are other techniques that have seen less, um, less investment, less hype, that may be equally useful or may need some resourcing to make them useful. Is that, is that true? I'm looking at you, David. You look at me. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you know, so I, I, I'm I'm a believer in what Ryan's also, you know, talking about. I think symbolic stuff is very important. You know, that historically, when the first AI Windsor came along, whatever, 1970, uh, early 60s, you know, basically people dropped this connectionist idea, right? Deep learning essentially was ditched in favor of things like symbolic reasoning. And um, I don't think we're gonna see that dropping again, but I do think that the symbiosis of these two is very important. And if you think about our, you know, our world, right? We have different kinds of things, we have perceptual stuff, right? The images and et cetera, and speech, and that's super useful. We, know we have that stuff on our phone and it's great. But to go beyond that, to have a, a system, this wondrous machine that we can actually talk to and interact with much more meaningfully, our culture, our, in our history, everything, our science, is, it's symbolically encoded in some way. So. It's super important that we, we start to, to address those issues. And I think that's it's challenging. There are you know, ways to think about that. But I think that's something that you know, we need to get much more serious about as a research community. Thank you. I was hoping you were going to say something about probabilistic reasoning, actually. Oh, I can tell you much more about it, but maybe I'll Maybe later. Because yeah. uh, we are running out of time. But, and I, there was one question I do want to cover, because it strikes me that um, this is quite a unique situation. We have um, Juran here who has built his business in Beijing. Ryan's in Silicon Valley. Obviously, David's based here in London and has built businesses here. And I'm interested to understand what are the different circumstances for trying to translate cutting edge research from lab to live, as it were, and whether they differ in those three areas. Ryan. 
Sure. So, so I moved out to uh, Silicon Valley from the East Coast in, in uh, from New York City in 2014, and one thing that struck me immediately was just the the ecosystem in Silicon Valley. I mean, people are willing to if you have an idea, people are willing to code for months before they ask for anything in return. As opposed to on the East Coast, if you come up with an idea, they're like, well, here's a consulting agreement, and I want this much equity, and that's before you even start coding. And I think, I think that's one of the, the big things of, of the ecosystem, where people are willing to take those risks, people are willing to help each other. And in Silicon Valley, it's unlike anything that I've, that I've seen, and there is that talent there that can help bring very advanced technologies to market. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of great universities there, and, and, and it's, it's the ecosystem is what makes Sil Silicon Valley. And yet, China seems to have uh, leapt ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's quite different. Because China is developing in a very fast pace, and so, I mean, it's very competitive. There are many companies doing, I mean, similar, uh, you know, uh, in similar areas, uh, doing similar technologies. And now, I mean, the situation is, I don't think like uh, the technology barrier is some barrier that you can you can you know keep for long because there are so many companies competing with you and all the algorithms they are like treasures for the human kind and everybody knows that. But the if you do business, I mean, you need to go very vertical and in that industry, then you build this this uh, like uh, industry barrier that you know you understand this industry. For example, we know the logics of business logics for call centers, we, we, we have a lot of knowledge about that and so that we can build a product that fulfill the customer demands in that industry. And the that's domain understanding. Yeah, domain, yeah. domain yeah. understanding. That's uh, you know, something that people can't compete with you in a very short time. They need to you know, invest a lot into that vertical domain. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think we're out of time. Do you have any closing comments there, David? No, I is think the future is very bright. I think um, you know, we need to stay on the positive so I think you know in the if you think about a lot of the current concerns that people have about in society about machine learning and AI generally it's a little bit uh, you know sort of people are very worried about it I think we need to sort of the yes, better than in mind but I think we need to you know we need to to sort of focus on the positives and I think that's that's too exciting that's a great way to finish and um, I'm sorry that we whipped through this session it was very short and please do join our speakers in the half hour now afterwards um, I'm going to invite Azim to the stage to introduce the next session, but first of all, please thank our speakers. Mm -hmm.